In the late 90s, a Digimon card game was released to go along with the Digimon IP. At the time, the game was Japanese only and went by the simple name Digimon Card. With Digimon rapidly gaining popularity in the West, the game was inevitably brought over to American audiences under a new name, the Digibattle Card Game. The game was released with a number of different changes that practically made it a completely different card game. Thus, the American audience decided to separate the two card games by calling the Japanese version of the game Ultimate Coliseum while keeping the name of the American card game Digibattle. The Japanese version of the game was never really revered as a well-made or well-polished game, but it has a lot of nostalgia for people growing up in the 90s because, in Japan, it was just a really fun game to pick up and play. In fact, every once in a while new sets will come out or promo cards will be printed for magazines, keeping the game somewhat alive. Here in America, on the other hand, the card game lasted from February of 2000 to near the end of 2001. Within this time frame, six sets were released. This is because Bondi of America wanted to start up a brand new Digimon card game, but that is a story for another day. We aren't really here to go in-depth on the history of the sales of the Digimon card game, but rather to look at the metagame and see how competitive play would have been operated had the game gotten bigger. If you are more interested in the history of the game itself, then I will leave a couple of links in the description box that you might find interesting. When it comes to American fan bases, one of the longest running rivalries is between Digimon and Pokemon. Fans who tend to gravitate towards one franchise or another tend to do so because of design. Pokemon designs tend to be cute and simple, while Digimon designs on the other hand tend to be more complex and experimental. And here in America anyways, the Pokemon fanbase usually beats out the Digimon fanbase when it comes to popularity. Me personally, I tend to gravitate more towards Digimon than Pokemon, but that's mainly because I feel like Digimon actually tries to innovate within their franchise, whereas Pokemon, it remains a little bit stagnant. One of the biggest examples of this being their video game franchises. To this day, it kills me that everybody ran out and bought Pokemon Sword and Shield at full price and didn't even give Digimon Cyber Sleuth Double Pack a chance. It's half the price and comes with two games that, in my personal opinion, are some of the best monster collecting and battling games on the market. Better story, more innovative gameplay, better graphics somehow, better characters, better post-game, more side content, and better online play. Half the price, and most Switch owners won't even give it a chance because it doesn't say Pokemon on it. Bitter? Who's bitter? Me bitter? I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter at all. The real question is, what does all of this have to do with the card game? Well, simply put, this is one of those times where I think Bondi saw the writing on the wall as soon as they decided to bring this card game over. It seemed like more of an experiment than something they were putting their whole heart into. Most of the changes made to this card game make little to no sense, and as far as I can find, there's really no specific reason for why the changes were made. In the face of Pokemon, Digimon always kind of feels like it's just getting the scraps, and this is definitely one of those cases where the Digimon card game got a little bit screwed over by the fact that it was just losing so badly to Pokemon. The card game we got was a horrible buggy mess, with very minimal playtesting or any kind of ingenuity behind the scenes at all, and I'm looking to prove that today. Going into this, I'm going to assume most of you know how the Digimon card game works on a more fundamental level, but just in case you don't, I will be leaving a link to a place where you can learn the rules in the description below, as well as going over briefly how the card game works as a whole. Each player will have a 30 card pre-made deck. The unique gimmick of this game being that there are no duplicates allowed within your deck, so each card will be different from the rest. If you've played a format called EDH, or Elder Dragon Highlander, then you'll know exactly what's going on here. At the beginning of the duel, each player will put one rookie-type Digimon from their deck face down onto the field, and then shuffle the remainder and put it in the deck area. Digimon all fall into one of three categories. You're either a red, a green, or a yellow. During each turn, you'll have a chance to level up your Digimon to the next level, beginning at Rookie, going into Champion, and then Ultimate, and then Mega. Once each player has had a chance to Digivolve, then each player will then start playing cards back and forth from their hands to give them an edge during the battle for that turn. Basically, Digimon were already set up to fight each other. 
your Digimon would use the attack that corresponded to the battle type of your opponent's Digimon. Since Gabumon's opponent is a red type, he will use his red attack. Agumon, on the other hand, will be using his green type attack, which has a power of 230. As you can see in this example, our Gabumon has a natural 120 power advantage against our opponent's Agumon. This means that during this phase where me and my opponent are playing cards back and forth, it's up to my opponent to somehow overcome that 120 power disadvantage to not lose the battle. I, on the other hand, don't really have to do much during this phase until my opponent becomes stronger than me. Once both players are done playing cards, a winner is decided based on higher total power. The winning player will score a number of points based on the level of the Digimon it's fighting. While it would have been way more interesting to see weaker Digimon get higher rewards based on their wins, it's basically just the level of the character you're fighting plus 100 for every level above yours. So if you beat something of the same rank, you're going to get 100 points. If you beat something of a rank higher, it'll be 200, so on and so forth. That's the basic flow of the game, but in order to crack this game wide open, there are a couple of nuances we're going to have to focus on. First of all, this game has an obnoxiously big 10 card hand limit. And at the beginning of the game, you'll be drawing 10 cards from your 29 card deck, so you're going to have a lot of cards a lot of the time. At the end of each turn, you'll be drawing back up to that 10 card hand limit, so what's interesting about this is, if you have 10 cards in your hand at the end of the turn, you technically don't have to draw anything. In fact, if you wanted, you could put yourself in a state where you never have to draw another card again. Which is useful, because as soon as you do have to redraw from your deck and you run out of cards, you have to devolve your Digimon back to its rookie rank, shuffle all cards from your hand and your side of the field back into your deck, and then redraw 10 new cards. This means once our dream Digimon is on the board, we want to make sure we play as few cards as possible. The closer we get to drawing to the end of our deck, the closer we get to busting our entire field. The second nuance is the penalty for losing a battle. Every time you lose a fight, your Digimon goes back to its earliest rank. This means that as soon as you start losing battles, there are very few ways to catch up, because every time you Digivolve, your opponent can just beat you again. If you get stuck in this loop, there's no way out of it until either your opponent wins or your opponent runs out of cards and has to de-Digivolve into its earlier rank. The problem there is, as I stated before, your opponent technically doesn't have to play any cards or draw any cards from their deck. As soon as you start losing, you're essentially playing solitaire until your opponent wins the game. So the metagame essentially devolves into get something nearly invincible on the board and then end your turn until your opponent gives up. That's basically the game, because there's nothing for you to do and playing cards would actually be detrimental until your opponent forces you to reset your hand. To say that this game is a mess or to say that it needs tweaking is a complete understatement. This game is just not finished. And what tickles me is we're not even at the worst part yet. There are three types of Digimon, red, yellow, green. And if you're a newbie to the game, or if you're somebody who hasn't done a ton of research, it kind of seems like it's an arbitrary choice. Each one has strong Digimon and weak Digimon, and it really comes down to preference, if you haven't done any research. After doing an extensive study and breakdown of how the Digimon in this game work, I can tell you that the entire card game revolves around the color yellow. In all seriousness, I can't even tell if this was done on purpose or not, but to understand the metagame behind this game, we have to understand how yellow works. Yellow's relationship with green is that it has an inherent advantage over it. This means that about 70-80% to 80 of the time, if your Digimon is yellow and your opponent's Digimon is green, you will be able to beat it through natural power. This seems pretty fair, and it's natural for color advantages to be a part of a game like this. On the other hand, Red Digimon have a UNIVERSAL 100% win rate against Yellow Digimon. Listen to me because I am not being hyperbolic. If your Digimon is red and your opponent's Digimon is yellow, then regardless of which Digimon you two are using, you will 100% win the battle. That's because the lowest possible attack a Digimon that is red against a Yellow Digimon can have is 350. The highest attack that a yellow Digimon can have against a red Digimon is 340. Look at this beautiful little card right here. Yellow Mega Piedmon. This card probably went for $7 to $10 back in the day. Highest possible rarity. Highest possible level. Probably among the highest possible stats. The kind of card that Patrick Bateman probably salivates over, you know what I mean? Now look at your red power. It's 340. That's okay. 
One Digimon can't be all-powerful. Every card's expected to have its strengths and weaknesses. Can't be that big of a deal, right? Your opponent plays 3-cent starter deck rookie Agumon, and you lose. Agumon packs 380 power against yellow opponents. Now listen to me. I understand that fail-safes have to be put into place to make it so that a weaker Digimon can still come back against a stronger Digimon to make the game more interesting. But 100% lose rate against the weakest possible Digimon in another color makes that color an absolute liability and 100% useless for competitive play. And this is the only kind of interaction like this in the game. Yellow doesn't 100% win against green, green doesn't 100% win against red, Yellow Digimon are the only ones that have to deal with a problem like this. And that's how I know your game wasn't playtested, Bondi, because if one competitive player had gotten a chance to look at your cards before you sent them out to the mass public, this kind of thing probably wouldn't have happened. As stated before, there's no real interaction between red and green. They are fairly well balanced against one another. As it should be! Sorry guys, I'm calm. It's not about me, it's about the metagame. So, where was the metagame around this time? So, I'm just gonna be real with you guys. I don't know. I've been researching this topic for literally over a week, and I can't find any definitive sources on how people were building their decks around the time. As far as I can tell, the Digimon Digibattle card game never had anything like worlds, or nationals, or even regionals, and because of that, there's really no data to collect from. If any major sanctioned events did happen around this time, it's just not well documented enough for me to know. Because of this, we're going to have to get a little experimental. Rather than explaining how the metagame was at the time, I'm going to explain to you how I would have gone about creating a deck in the meta at the time. I'm not claiming to be the end-all be-all of card games or anything, but I do have something of a knack when it comes to testing card games like this, so I am pretty confident that I can come up with an idea of how the meta would have eventually shaped had the meta game actually existed back then. I've rigorously tested and documented every single Digimon versus every other Digimon in the entire game. My work here is extremely thorough, so I hope you'll trust me when I say I know what I'm talking about when it comes to this game. Let me explain how my documentation works. When the first booster pack came out, you would have had access to the booster and the starter, which had a total of 90 Digimon to choose from. At first glance, you may think that the Digimon are sorted equally, but that is in fact not the case. There are 31 red Digimon, 28 green Digimon, and 31 yellow Digimon. Because this is the order that attacks are listed on all of the Digimon cards, this is the way that I decided to notate which color goes in which spot. So throughout this video, when you see the three numbers lined up like this, it's always red, then green, then yellow. A card's worth within the metagame can be numerically determined by determining how many other cards that card can beat. Agumon, for example, can defeat or tie against six red Digimon within the metagame. It loses against all green Digimon, and it beats all yellow Digimon. Therefore, it can be determined that Agumon can defeat a total of 37 Digimon in the game, meaning that his win percentage is about 41%. What this means is, if your current Digimon is Agumon, and your opponent plays a Digimon, there is a 41% chance that you can defeat the Digimon on your opponent's side of the board. These numbers can even tell us much more than just which card is better than which card in a certain slot. The cards you see here that are marked C are Champion, or Level 2 type Digimon, whereas the U stands for Ultimate, meaning those are Level 3 type Digimon. What this means is that despite being one rank lower, Greymon and Gatomon are both much more powerful than their counterparts Scorpiomon or Skullmaramon. This is due to the simple fact that they can have similar win rates despite being much weaker Digimon. This is also a pretty hilarious example of how toxic that 100% win rate that reds have against yellows is in the metagame. As you can no doubt see for yourself, both Greymon and Gatomon have a 31 in their yellow slot, showing that they have a 100% win rate against yellow Digimon. This defect within the card game inflates their win rate significantly. Because red cards have this massive advantage with no real disadvantage, red cards are the most powerful cards in the game, as their win rates will always be no less than 33%. This type of natural disadvantage is most common when you're looking at rookie-type Digimon. If Candlemon is your rookie Digimon of choice, 
you'll naturally be able to beat 7 red and 5 green Digimon, giving you a 13% win rate. If you use Tentamon on the other hand, you have a 35% win rate. If you ignore the win rate against yellow for a second, Tentamon can only beat one other red Digimon and zero green Digimon. Meaning that if the inflation from the 100% win rate against yellow weren't a thing, Digimon like this would have a much, much, much lower win rate. But because of this, Digimon like Candlemon become completely irrelevant and look totally deflated against this 35% win rate. So unless you need Candlemon for a very specific Digivolution, you will never see it in a game. Now, credit where credit is due, there is a very slight amount of depth when it comes to looking at these win rates. It's not simply higher win rate means better card. When looking at these two cards here, Scorpiomon and Ogremon, you may notice that Scorpiomon has a 17% increased win rate against any card in the game. However, you'll also notice that that number is more evenly spread. Remember that the middle number represents green, and green only has 28 cards, meaning that Scorpiomon still loses to four other green Digimon in the game, where on the other hand, Ogremon actually wins against all 28. With a statistic like this in mind, it's actually more valuable to use Ogremon than it is Scorpiomon. Despite being one rank lower, it automatically wins against a green Digimon, so you would use it in your deck for that specific purpose. Now that you hopefully understand my process, let's get to the nitty gritty. How would you go about building a deck in this time frame? Well, the first thing you would need is a core Digimon. When deciding your core Digimon, you can technically choose any Digimon you want, but these are the six that I would recommend, as they are the six with the highest possible win rates. Your immediate instinct might be to just use Skull Mammothmon because it has a 96% win rate, highest win rate in the game, and it's obviously not that bad of a place to start. But believe it or not, and again, credit where credit is due, there is a bit more nuance here than there might seem at first. If you'll take a look at Andromon and Asuramon, you'll notice that they're actually Ultimate Digimon rather than Mega Digimon. This advantage is much more important than you might initially think, because this gives them access to a card we'll look at later that Mega Digimon don't have access to. It also means they're on the board earlier, and they give up less points when they're defeated. So let's take a look at some of these core cards. As stated previously, Skull Mammothmon is the most powerful Digimon in the game, which I guarantee you is not on purpose. He's an extremely common Digimon, if you didn't watch the show, he's not really that prevalent in the TV show at all, and he's not exactly a fan favorite. But he doesn't lose to a single red or yellow card in the game, meaning he essentially has immunity against both of those colors. And when it comes to green Digimon, there are only three Digimon in the game that can naturally beat him. When you consider there are 90 cards in the game, being able to beat 87 of them naturally without power boosts is a pretty big win. Magnadramon makes a little more sense, being the digivolution of one of the main characters. You'll notice the win rates are quite similar, with the exception that it loses to one more red, that being Skull Mammothmon himself. But that's kind of made up for with the fact that this Digimon here has more Digimon that can evolve into it, giving you more options. It also has the fly keyword. We haven't really gotten into keywords and what they do, but we will, don't worry. Just know that having fly is incredibly good. Andromon trades a little bit of win percentage for being one level lower. There are only eight Digimon in the entire game that can beat him in a fight, so he has a 90% win rate. And that means that Andromon might actually be a better choice than the other two. However, keep in mind you will still have to run a Mega in your deck. When you Digivolve into a Mega, you get an immediate 300 point boost, so giving that up is just, it can't happen, it's not an option for you. Because of this, your Mega Evolution will be slightly weaker, but you can just play off of Andromon until you're at 700 points, and then play your Mega into Andromon to get the win. Asuramon is the exact same Digimon as Andromon. The only reason you would choose to use one over the other is for Digivolution. So if there's a specific Digimon you're using that evolves into Asuramon and not Andromon, use him, or vice versa. Marine Angemon once again gives up a little bit of win percentage for an ability, in this case it's Swim. Like I said before, these abilities do come into play later in the game, so don't count them out. I'd also like to point out that this is one of the few secret rares in the game that actually earns its rank. Sadly, most of the super rares are kind of bad. 
Hercules, sadly, is kind of the bottom of the barrel. There's really no reason to run Hercules over Magna, except for the fact that your build path is slightly better. It's kind of up to you whether you want to risk the lower win percentage to have a slightly better build path. It does make your transition a bit smoother, but once you actually get here, you may kind of wish that you had the other one instead. For such a simplistic seeming card game, this much variety in your main Digimon choice is actually pretty refreshing. Building a competitive deck would begin by starting with one of these six Digimon and then choosing the rest of your deck around it. What's interesting here is even though you have a lot of freedom with which Digimon you want to start with, as soon as you start with your core Digimon, the rest of the deck is going to sort of build itself. Since Skull Mammothmon is sort of our easiest choice here, I'm going to go ahead and show how I would have built a deck around him. First, we need a core path, something that we can follow 100% of the time that will always get us into Skull Mammothmon. We have to choose between Mammothmon and Meiotismon. Well, that's going to be an easy choice. Mammothmon is red. Meiotismon is yellow. We're obviously going to choose the red. For the sake of fairness, I will point out that Meiotismon has a 100% win rate against green, but uh, this late, I, I just don't think it's worth it. There are lower level Digimon that also have a 100% win rate against green. When it comes to Mammothmon's pre-dig, we have a slightly harder decision to make, Apemon and Garurumon. Neither of them are yellow, so both of them are viable. Gururumon has a much lower win percent rate, but it has a much higher win percent rate against red specifically. You can also digivolve it from Tapirmon for only one card, whereas if you choose Apemon, regardless of which decision you make, one of those Digimon is going to cost you two cards. So the best idea here might be to actually just include them both. Gururumon gives us an edge against reds, and Apemon gives us an edge against yellow. The Gururumon decision is a little bit difficult too. Gabumon is actually one of the worst Digimon in the entire game, whereas Tapirmon is pretty respectable. But Tapirmon only wins against 5 other reds, and Gabumon wins against 11 reds. I'd say something like include them both, but I actually think this spot is much better for another Digimon, so we're going to go with Tapirmon. Another thing that makes Tapirmon good is the fact that Apemon actually comes from Tapirmon as well. Now that we have a core Digivolve path, we need some staples. As I alluded to earlier, Ogremon is the perfect answer to green, because it has a 100% win or tie rate with all green Digimon. It's also a champion, so it's very easy to get it out on the first turn, and if your opponent does happen to play a red and step over you, then that's kind of your own fault. This should only ever hit the board when you know for a fact your opponent has a green Digimon in play, or is planning on playing a green Digimon. As much as I love Patamon personally, Kunemon is going to be your better choice here. The entire reason you're playing Ogremon is because you want a 100% win rate card against green, and Kunemon has almost that. It has a 22 out of 28 win rate, meaning there are only 6 green cards that can actually beat him in a fight. On the other hand, Patamon's stats are kind of terrible. Since we can already answer yellow 100% perfectly with our red rookies, and we can now answer green almost perfectly and then perfectly with a champion, we need something that can also deal with red. As stated before, red really doesn't have a weakness, it doesn't lose 100% at any level until you actually get to Skull Mammothmon. But Wizardmon comes pretty darn close. He wins against 28 out of 31. That's pretty insane. He's a champion that can pretty much beat every red in the game with the exception of the top three cards. And hilariously, he also digivolves from Tapirmon. That thing might as well be a freaking ditto with how many options it gives you. Unfortunately, from here, the world is kind of just your oyster. If there was actual battle data I could pull from, I could very, very easily tailor the rest of the deck to beating whatever was popular currently in the meta. As extensive as my research might be, it can be even more extensive with the existence of tournament lists. And from that, we could fill out the rest of our deck. That doesn't necessarily mean we're done, however. Hilariously, there were two effect Digimon released in this set. Typically, Megas are also effect Digimon because they have the effect of giving you 300 points when you play them, but that's not necessarily the same thing. If Nanimon wins a fight, discard the top card of your opponent's deck. If Bakemon ties in a fight, revert your opponent's Digimon back to Rookie. Bakemon's effect is just hilariously dumb. There's just no way to consistently make sure you're going to tie with your opponent, and if you do want to build a deck around that, then godspeed to your friendo, but that's definitely not for me. Nanimon's effect is mostly passable. Unfortunately, due to his color, he only has a 29% win rate. So even though this card can technically be splashed into a deck, 
I wouldn't highly recommend it, just because it's much better to have something with a higher win rate on the field rather than something that may discard the top card of your opponent's deck. I hypothesize that a deck should probably have between 16 and 26 Digimon to leave plenty of room for power options. In fact, when it comes to power options, I believe they come in certain tiers. There are conditionals, must-haves, really good, and eh, if you have room. The first conditional is with force effects. They all do the same thing. They push your Digimon into using a different attack than the one your opponent has set for you. And again, without knowing too much about the meta, we don't know which one of these would have been the most useful. But I imagine all of them have some pretty extreme potential. To be honest, if I were playing this game competitively, I'd probably find a way to just force all three in, just in case. Digivices are non-optional. You have to have them to digivolve into certain Digimon. Mammothmon and Skull Mammothmon, for example, need a red Digivice. Because of that, we would have to put both red and the red and green Digivice into our deck. Keep in mind, there are no advantages to the single red versus the red and green Digivice when you're choosing for your deck, but because we can only have one of each, we have to take them both. If you're ever at a point where you have to choose, though, always, always, always just choose the dual colored one, because again, there is no downside. Remember earlier when I was talking about abilities? This is where it pays off. The abilities Swim, Fly, and Dig give you access to specific cards. They are also hilariously shameless ripoffs of Pokemon HMs, but let's not talk about that. These abilities range from just completely busted to, eh, it's still pretty good. The Dig one in the middle is definitely the best, it just straight up doubles your power. Its limiter is that it can only be used against green Digimon, but green Digimon are still going to be pretty prevalent, so it's not that big of a downside. The swim one on the right that affects red cards is probably going to be the most useful, because all of the most powerful Digimon in the game are going to be red. This also maybe gives your yellows a chance of actually winning a fight against one of them. Fly's Bomb Dive on the left there, it's not quite as good as the other two, but it gives a straight 100 boost against the Digimon you're fighting as long as it is either yellow or green. It technically gives you less power than the other two, but the fact that it's useful against two different types makes it pretty okay. Honestly, all of these cards are pretty good. If you're using any Digimon that have any of these powers, there's really no reason not to run them in your deck. If your Digimon doesn't have a power and you would like it to have that power, then there's actually three cards that will give you those powers instead. Fly Away, Aquatic Attack, and Iron Drill all give your Digimon a power, being Fly, Swim, and Dig respectively. They also give your Digimon a 20 point power boost, which, while it might not sound like a lot, can actually increase your chances of victory by about 2 or 3 percent. The only reason that running a strategy like this might not be that common is because it really bloats your deck. And again, I just can't say for sure how many Digimon you'd be expected to run in this metagame. If it turned out that you only really needed 11 or 12 Digimon to make a deck work, then maybe I could see these three cards and the three power cards before them being an absolute necessity, but six cards just seems like a lot when your deck size is only 30. What I would say is maybe if you're going to go ahead and throw in one of the cards from before because one of your Digimon has that ability already, and you want to make sure that another Digimon could still use it, maybe go ahead and throw in that ability card. Outside of these conditional cards are four cards that I believe every meta deck would have needed to function. Counterattack doubles your power if your Digimon level is lower than your opponent's, so for example if you're a champion and your opponent is an ultimate or a mega. Just to be clear, doubling your power is the highest form of power boost that this game has, so anything that says double your power is immediately going to be good. And the condition of having a lower level Digimon than your opponent is just, it's so easy. It's going to happen eventually. You need this card. Power Freeze cancelled out your opponent's Digivolve power or your opponent's Force Effects powers. Something I have to clarify here is the wording on this card is extremely poor. It doesn't do anything to your opponent's Digivolve. Like, if your opponent is Digivolving, you can't use this to cancel out their Digivolve, but there are cards geared specifically towards the Digivolve phase, and this card gets rid of them. It also stops you from losing to a random Force FX. Even Steven, the card game equivalent of picking up your toys and going home, it's essentially a Temper Tantrum card. If you feel like your opponent's getting a little bit too powerful, or if your opponent's just blasted through all of their best cards, you play Even Steven, and the entire duel for that turn is reset. 
This means there will be no battle for the turn, nobody scores any points, and nobody loses any Digimon. It's basically just a really funny way to answer any of your opponent's trump cards. Option Eater voids Power Blasts. I mean, need I say more? It essentially gets rid of all the cards I was just talking about, so... Yep, it's necessary. The next cards we're going to look at are cards that you should never ever prioritize when building your deck. However, if after you've put everything you want in your deck, you still have room, these are some really good options. Downgrade has some pretty interesting plays. Its most obvious use, of course, is if you draw it in your opening hand and your opponent goes into champion, then you can just immediately de-digivolve them down to a lower level and actually kind of screw up their plans a little bit. Keep in mind, there are no duplicates in this game, so if your opponent ever wants another chance at playing that card, they're going to have to cycle through their entire deck again. In fact, drawing this card in your opening hands can kind of just immediately gimp your opponent and win you the game, but that's a pretty rare state. Its other use is to change the color of your main Digimon. So if you start out with a red and you Digivolve into a green or a yellow, but then your opponent plays a yellow and you need to go back down into being red, then you can play this on your own card in order to trick your opponent. That's essentially a free win and 200 points. This is probably a card that people remember fondly, but honestly, it's really not that good. Digi-Duel is essentially a win more button, where if you are going to win the current duel, you can drop Digi-Duel to get double the points. I can definitely see this card being good sometimes, but it's just got too heavy of a cost. First, you have to drop some cards from your hand in order to play this, and if you're in a game-winning state, you want to be dropping as little cards as possible because you don't want to have to deck refresh yourself and end up getting rid of your best Digimon. Next, you can't use it if your opponent passes during the Power Blast phase, which is a little bit arbitrary, I don't really understand why that's a restriction. And then finally, you can't use it if you have a Rookie, which is where you would have gotten your biggest power spike. You can still hypothetically play this when you have a Champion and your opponent has a Mega and still manage to get 600 points off of it, but eh, it's kind of a gamble. Run it if you want, but it's probably only going to do something for you about 40% of the time. Ultra Digivolve is another one of those cards that people probably remember really fondly, probably because it has super cool artwork. I'm not gonna lie, this card has a lot of potential, but its problem stems from the fact that there's only one situation where this card will ever be good. You have to have 700 or more points, and you have to have an ultimate Digimon in play. You can play Ultra Digivolve to go into your Mega without using any of its requirements, and then bing bang boom, you've won the game but outside of that one particular situation, this card really isn't that good. You have to sack your entire hand in order to play this card, and you have to do it during the Digivolve phase, so you're not even going to get a chance to play anything during the Power Blast phase. Outside of winning the game with a Mega, this card is nearly unplayable. That's why I consider it not a must-have. Next up, we have our eh cards. Just eh. To be completely honest, I don't see how you could possibly have any space left in your deck after the last cards we just looked at, but I mean, if somehow you've got like 29 cards and you're looking for something to fill in that last spot, and for some reason you don't want to use any of the cards I just talked about, hypothetically you could use one of these. Metal Attack is like the perfect eh card. It gives you plus 50 power with no condition other than dropping one card from your hand, so... I mean, it can be good, it can raise your win percentage by quite a significant margin in some cases, but it's kind of just eh. Power differences are going to get way bigger than 50 in most cases, so in the rare case that your opponent is beating you by exactly 40 power, this is going to win you the game, but other than that, it's not that great. Two Champion actually reverses your Digivolve, so instead of your ultimate going to Mega, you can turn your ultimate into a Champion, or even turn your Mega into a Champion. The use cases for this are very low, um, I mean you could definitely use it in some creative ways. The most creative way I can think of is if you have more than one Mega in your deck, then you can play a Mega to get the 300 point boost, then you can two champion it to bring it back to a champion and then re-digivolve it back up into another mega in order to get another 300 points. Definitely something you can build a deck around, but if you're not building a deck specifically revolving around this card, I really don't think it's worth putting in any deck. Flytrap may in some cases be worth decking in. If your opponent has the fly ability, they lose 50 power, which, considering one of the most powerful Digimon in the game has flying, I could definitely see somebody teching this into their deck. 
For the record, Swim and Dig also have cards like this, but they're much more rare, so I don't really know if I would consider them techable cards, unless there was a specific metagame where those cards were viable. But you could definitely throw a random flytrap into your deck and get some value off of it if you really wanted to. I honestly don't think there's much more I can say. If anybody were taking the game seriously around the time that this card game came out, that's definitely the mindset they would have had when they were building their deck. I suppose I could do something like throwing up a sample deck, or even going more in-depth with the history of the game, but that's not really what this particular series is for, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, please leave it in the comment section below and I'll think about making a separate video for it. Despite all of the negativity in this video, this is only the first set of six. With such a broken foundation, where could a second set possibly go? I guess we'll just have to find out next time.